Thank you, Sarah. Um, and thank you to all of you. And Siobhan, thank you very much for inviting me to be here today to talk about Labour's plans for our economy. A plan that can be summed up in just one word. Growth. I'm serious. That's it. Now, in the job that I'm doing, you get to see a lot of the country. You're on the road every week. So I know we have enormous problems in our economy and our communities. But honestly, it's obvious to me that the root cause of so many of our challenges is a lack of economic growth. Now, I know what a lot of people in Westminster say about growth. They say it's an abstract concept, doesn't resonate, doesn't connect with people's lives. I don't accept that. Growth is higher wages. Growth is stronger communities. Growth is thriving businesses. It's more vibrant high streets, less poverty, more opportunity, warmer homes, healthier food, better jobs. It's public services that are well-funded. It's holidays, meals out, more cash in your pocket, and an end to the suffocating cost of living crisis. Our ticket to win the race for the future and the biggest single thing we need to lift our sights, raise our ambitions, get our hope, our confidence, and our future back. And, and look, if we're elected, we'll approach this with a new mindset, a new purpose, and a new approach to governing. We will be driven by five clear missions, measurable missions. Missions that embrace the challenge of clear accountability, set a focused direction, and bring the whole country together to move us forward. So our economic mission, our goal on growth, the target we'll put in the next Labour manifesto is this. In the next Parliament, Britain will have the highest sustained growth in the G7. It's ambitious, I know that. And I don't make any apologies for that. The highest sustained growth in the G7, that should draw a sharp intake of breath. And yes, I am aware of the headwinds. We've got to navigate our way through revolutions in technology, in energy, in medicine, and with an ageing society, even in who we are. Climate change is a recipe for global instability. The shape of power in the world is changing. There's a war on our continent. And because of all of this, we must square up to a new economic era, where the old assumptions on labour, on energy, on trade and goods no longer apply. No doubt about it. All your company risk registers will be long, I know that. But the way I see it, there are also opportunities to be seized, new markets to open up, a more prosperous future that can be won. Take net zero and the green industries of tomorrow. A new global market of up to one trillion pounds. But, of course, a competitive market, where countries all around the world, not just in the US, are setting a new tempo, a dash for green growth, and we've got to be on the pitch. This is the biggest opportunity to make our country work for working people that we've had in decades. And it's no good carping from the sidelines, holding on to an outdated economic logic as the rest of the world eats our lunch. Some nation is going to design medicines personalised to match our unique DNA. Why not this one? Some nation will create the first generation of quantum computers. Why not us? Some nation will lead the world in offshore wind. Why not Britain? I'll tell you one reason why not. Our planning system. I've met people running the national grid recently. You know what they said to me? They said, if we want to get anywhere near our goals on net zero, we need to build more infrastructure in the next seven years than we have in the last 30. 
Let that sink in. And yet, what's the average time it takes to build an offshore wind farm? 13 years. An entire Tory government. <laughs> and, now, and now, house building crashing to a record low. Onshore wind, just two turbines built last year. Critical infrastructure, like HS2, built more slowly and expensively because of the red tape. And the net result, an economy stuck in second gear. A doom loop of low growth, low productivity, and high taxes. A generation and its hopes, an entire future blocked. By those who more often than not enjoy the secure homes and jobs that they're denying to others. The evidence couldn't be clearer. There are 38 countries in the OECD, and we are the second worst when it comes to the effectiveness of our planning system. And just think, some people call our problems the productivity puzzle. We know the problems. We've just got to show a bit more bottle to fix them. I mean, I listened to the Prime Minister at the dispatch box recently, burying his head in the sand on this issue, playing to the Tory gallery. That's not serious. You can't be serious about raising productivity, about improving the supply side capacity of our economy, about arresting our economic decline, without a plan for wind farms, the laboratories, the warehouses, and the homes this country so desperately needs. That doesn't work for Britain. It doesn't work for business. It doesn't work for growth. And I won't accept it. Because there's nothing that reeks more of decline than the idea that this country no longer knows how to build things. So mark my words, we will take on planning reform. We will bring back local housing targets. We'll streamline the process for national infrastructure projects and commercial development. And we'll remove the veto used by big landowners to stop shovels hitting the ground. Tough choices, but the right choices. Choices we make with our eyes wide open. We choose the builders, not the blockers. The future, not the past. Renewal, not decline. We choose growth. And there's a bigger lesson here. In this new, more volatile economic era, businesses need a government that gets involved. There's no future in a stand-aside state. That won't deliver the stability and the certainty, won't manage the tide of change that's coming. It's, it's simple, really. Every business in this room has a strategy for growth. A nation needs one, too. And that's not a return to the mistakes of the past. We've got to get over that hangover. In every one of our competitors, industrial policy is the bread and butter of responsible economic management. About what the state does, not how big it is. How it can support businesses of all sizes to innovate and grow. Can bring in the creative brilliance of our scientists and universities. Can work with trade unions and bring you all together to unleash the potential of our strengths, our cutting-edge technology sector, our superpower services, life sciences that save lives. It's a shared undertaking that is not state control or pure free markets, but a genuine partnership, sleeves rolled up, working in the national interests. This is fundamental to my politics. I believe in the power of dynamic government, but I also believe in the brilliance of British businesses. And I've changed my Labour Party to reflect that. We're not just a pro-business party, we're a party that is proud of being pro-business, that respects the contribution profit makes to jobs, to growth, and to our tax base. Gets that working people want success as well as support understands 
that robust private sector growth is the only way we pay our way in the world. But look, I've also got to be clear. We hold our hand out in partnership, but we do it with an uncompromising purpose. The purpose that shapes everything we want to achieve in government, all five of our national missions. That is to change this country so it once again respects, serves, and delivers for working people. We're going to tip the scales away from the vested interests that have held our businesses and our economy back for too long. The blockers, the stiflers, those who are comfortable with Tory stagnation and failure. And they're not going to give up without a fight. That's not how change happens. But these past 13 years, what working people have been through what businesses have been through. Nearly record numbers of small businesses going under. And every one of those, a personal tragedy, an ambition, a dream, an investment in a better future, gone. All this, it has to be a turning point. Britain needs a new business model. And changing a business model is hard, you know that. It requires mission, purpose, determination, openness and partnership, absolutely. But it also requires hard choices. So I want to set out five priorities, very quickly, I promise. Five key economic shifts that will underpin our mission for growth. The building blocks, if you like, of our strategy to lead Britain out of its low growth, high tax, doom loop. Shift one, from chaos to certainty, the rock of economic stability that must underpin everything that we do. This is why you need a government that gets involved, that takes active strategic decisions. It's the only way to provide real certainty in this era. Investors in this country need a clear framework that holds for the long term, with policies that are always fully costed, Fiscal rules, sound and followed rigorously. Institutions, respected, not bypassed. All our aspirations must be built on this. And don't doubt us for a second. But honestly, the way I see it, stability is the least the British people should expect. Britain needs certainty, yes, but also change. So shift two, we must move the economy that holds potential to one that unlocks it everywhere. Communities need to be in charge of their economic destiny. Growth comes from the grassroots, and it must provide secure, well-paid jobs in all areas of the country. Britain is far too centralised, and this hurts us economically. A politics that hoards power goes hand in hand with an economy that hoards potential. I'm utterly convinced by this. So we will give the communities and nations of this country the right powers to drive private sector growth and to get their high streets growing again. New powers for councils to take over empty retail units. And yes, we will level the playing field with online warehouses. We will scrap and replace business rates. Shift three, Britain must go from lagging to leading, must get on the pitch in science, technology, green growth, and the opportunities of tomorrow. That's why we need a reformed planning system, need a modern industrial strategy, need a more powerful British business bank that will help scale businesses new and old, and why we need a government that won't sit on the sidelines that will invest for, train people for, crowd in finance for, scale up supply chains for, reform procurement for, has a plan for the green jobs and cheaper energy of the future. That will use every tool at our disposal to make sure Britain becomes a superpower in green growth. Shift four, we've got to stop creating insecure work and thinking, 
job done. Nobody here would be happy with a job that didn't provide security or respect. So neither should we be happy with an economic model that demands this from working people. And that isn't fair to businesses doing the right thing. This is absolutely critical for us. We don't see a labour market that locks in low pay and productivity as beyond reform. We see it as an opportunity to finally make work pay for millions. That's why we'll offer more flexible skills funding, a reformed apprenticeship levy, a modernised childcare system, and a new deal on employment rights that we know the Tories will attack in the usual way. <laughs> there isn't a single advance for workers in this country that they haven't resisted. But we are here to restore the Labour Party to its purpose of serving working people. And we think categorically that this will be good for growth. Shift five. Our economy must become more resilient to global shocks and we must be more open to global trade. This cannot be a choice. That might work in a seminar room or the political arena, but it doesn't work for businesses trying to export. So we've got to use the levers, like procurement creatively, nurture more resilient supply chains, and fix the Brexit deal. We've got to project a more open stance to the world. Believe me, I know how important this is. Global standing has to be earned, not taken for granted. Nobody owes us a future. When the big questions are asked around the conference tables all around the world, where do we put our money? Where do our jobs go? Where does our investment in a better future go? We have to make sure the answer to that comes back to a resounding, why not Britain? That's what our mission is about. That's why we need more growth. And I want everyone here to know, we are ready to take on that challenge and we will deliver. I know because I see more and more people lining up shoulder to shoulder with Labour. Businesses crying out for a government that backs them to grow. Working people desperate for an economy that puts their interests first. Everyone from scientists to pipe fitters, data engineers to plumbers. A union of the willing impatient to build a better Britain. That's the businesses, the builders, the British public. Together, no less than the backbone of our economy, the backbone of our country, in partnership, the backbone of our country united in their hope for a better future. With that backbone supporting us, we can unlock Britain's untapped opportunities. We can renew our country can go for growth and build a better Britain. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. We've got a number of questions, starting with um, some questions from the media, um, and I think First of those is Romley from ITV. Romley, there you are. Hi there, Sir Keir. You promised to take on planning reform. Does one of the tough choices you refer to include building on the green belt? And is that really the answer to Britain's, to England's uh, housing woes? Let me be clear about what our uh, ambition is here. And, and that's what I meant when I said in my speech that we back the builders, not the blockers. The aspiration to own your own home is real. It's a dream for so many people. And it's more than a dream, it's actually about security. Uh, and I know from my own upbringing that although we didn't have a lot of money, we did own our own home with a mortgage. And that meant there was a security that went with it. And that dream is being killed. It's being killed by a government that's taken down the targets for housing, and everybody in this room will know that means that building of houses is likely to drop now to the lowest level since the Second World War. And so the dream, the aspiration of owning your own home, is going to be killed. And we need to do something about that, Romilly. And 
what we need to do is put the targets back up. But if that's all we do, we'll just go back to where we were at the tail end of last year when we weren't building enough homes. So we need to do more than that and fix planning and also have development corporations as a vehicle for building homes. And when I say fixed planning, what I mean by that is giving more power to local areas to direct where housing will be built. Um, and that does mean uh, decisions about the green belt. Now, don't get me wrong, just like everybody else in this room, I want to protect the green belt. I value our countryside. Um, but this is about choosing where development takes place. There is already building on the green belt. The question is, do local areas have sufficient... And an example that I would give is um, some building of houses in the southeast of England where the choice was between a playing field and a car park. And the car park was technically on the green belt and the playing field wasn't. And so the houses were built on the playing field, not the car park. We've got to take better decisions than that. So we want to give power to local areas to have much more control over where they build uh, and with development corporations to put those houses up. And that is tough choices, and it's tough choices about the Green Belt. Of course we want protection of the Green Belt, but we also want to recognise there is building on the Green Belt, but it needs to be on the right bit of it, in the car park, not the playing field. Um, and um, that is a, the sort of tough decision that this government has backed away from, and the net result is we won't have the houses built that will help people in their dream to own their own home. Thank you, Romilly. I think we're going to go to Kieran at The Guardian next. Thank you very much, Kieran Stacey from The Guardian. Um, just to follow up on Romilly's question, <clears throat> you talk about giving more powers to local councils. Are you also willing to override local councils who don't do enough to build, who perhaps block developments that you think could help ease the housing crisis? And the second one on housing, if I may, uh, you talk about reform to the leaseholder system. You talk about ending leaseholding on new developments, but you haven't gone further and said that you want to end leasehold on existing buildings and allow existing leaseholders a way out of their current contracts. Would you go further and, and say that as well? Uh, on the question of local authorities, we want to put the targets up, and we want them to be real, and we want them to be achieved. Um, we want to work with local authorities on that, give them the power to do that. Very often, local authorities tell me that um, amongst the problems is that it's the landowners and the developers who actually choose where the housing is, and the local authority can't direct that. So give them more powers, and you unlock some of the blockage in the system, reforming the planning system along the um, way. So we do want to give those powers. I would also be open to um, looking at whether this can be done on a pan-local authority basis, because I think amongst the problems we've got is that this is all very piecemeal, very, very localised. And actually, if you look at... Uh, the infrastructure, if you look at the way we want to grow the economy, it would make sense, in my view, to uh, club together local authorities in certain areas of the country so that together they could plan the housing that could be built in the best place. An example would be along train lines um, to build the businesses and the communities to feed and support the infrastructure that we desperately need, uh, which again is a major driver of growth. And when it comes to house building, um, I've spoken about the aspiration of people to have their own home, which is very, very real, but also house building is a route to economic growth, um, both the building and the other uh, aspects that it can, of growth that it can unlock along the way. O on leasehold um, reform, um, firstly, I think the uh, 2020 Law Commission recommendations are about right, and we would implement them, and I think it's a crying shame that the government, having said that it accepted those recommendations on leasehold, um, has now backed away because it says it's run out of road, run out of ideas, hasn't got time to do it. So Michael Gove, as I said, he understands the injustice and why the system doesn't work, but now he's not going to do the second bit of what he promised. So we will pick that up um, and we will do that, and that does mean reforming existing leaseholds um, and following the recommendation about new leaseholds. Thank you, Kieran. And I think we've got Jack from City AM. Jack. Uh, thanks, Kieran. Jack Bonner from City AM. Um, you, lots of businesses room are keen to invest in the UK economy, but they're quite hesitant to do so as a result of all the tax and spending policies we've seen scrapped over the last couple of years by the present government. I uh, was just wondering what more assurances you can give to the people in this room that Labour 
will create an environment to allow investment to thrive in the UK and boost growth? I think it's vital that we create the circumstances for investment to thrive. It's absolutely vital. We will not get growth unless we do that. And I've spoken to no end of investors, um, some in this room, some in the UK, some across the globe, and they are very clear with me that until there's proper stability and certainty and long-term planning and strategy from the government, it's very difficult to create the circumstances to invest. And you know, we often think that the idea that we've had four chancellors and four budgets in the last 12 months is, is politically funny. It makes for a good cartoon. It's hopeless when it comes to investment. They are not the condition. The investors who tell me they are withholding the investment they might otherwise put into our country because the conditions aren't right. So stability has to be the key to that. And of course, you know, you touch on high tax. Why have we got such a high tax regime? In my view, it's because we've got low growth. So that, that, that's, it, that's why I call it a doom loop. You've got low growth, low growth, low growth leading to high tax. Highest tax, as you know, uh, since the Second World War. We've got to break out of that cycle. That is about um, certainty, stability, having a plan for growth, using the partnership that we can uh, put together with businesses. We want to partner with business. Uh, we want to be clear what the government does and what business does. Um, and we want to take tough decisions, like changing the planning laws. Lots of business said to me, what's stopping me moving forward is it takes too long. The example I give about uh, wind turbines is just an example. What should take two or three years, taking 13 years. There are many examples that people around this room will have in their own sector. And we've got, you know, for too long we've been cowed by this. We have a government that's just not prepared to take the tough decisions. We've got to take those tough decisions. Thank you very much. I think, Aisha, I'm now joining you for questions, and then we're going to take questions from the audience. So I look forward to that. Great.